Thanks everyone for coming today. And uh, welcome to the Gini workshop. I'm Pere Jimenez, data science advocate at Gini. And today I will be showing you how to build a production grade data app from design to deployment. Now, before we start, uh, I intend this to be uh, an interactive workshop where you will code along with me. So please, if you would like to code along with me, set up your systems with the information that you will find here in this GitHub repository at pidwithgini slash Gini framework, sorry, Gini workshop. And you can do this while I give you an introduction to the Gini framework. Okay, so first, before we start, can I ask how many of you have actually used Gini in a project that's a personal or at work? Can you raise your hands, please? Okay, that's not many hands raised, which is uh, it's good because it means that there's interest about learning uh, about Gini, so thank you. Now, most of you know that Gini is an open source project, but what you know, might not know is that it is actually a startup as well. For some history, Gini started in 2016 when our, uh, well, the creator of the Gini framework, Adrian Salceno, who's a full stack developer with over 20 years of experience, he was looking for a language with a higher performance and he found Julia. And given the lack of web tooling in Julia, he decided to just implement his own full stack web framework. Then he introduced the framework in 2017 at JuliaCon, and it was well received by the community, and the, well, the framework started growing. In 2021, he met uh, our co-founder, uh, Cinzia Palumbo, who's sitting right here, and they started the company together to support Gini and build uh, commercial tooling about it, around it. Then last year, we managed to secure some funding to increase growing Gini and bring it to the next step. This is the team behind Gini. Here we can see uh, Adrian, Cynthia, Danny, who's our no code chief, and here I'm myself. And we are backed by some of the top venture capitals uh, in the software industry and data. Uh, well, Gini Framework, since its inception uh, to, to the day of today, it has become the number one web framework in Julia with thousands of downloads over 2,000 uh, stars on GitHub, and an active community of uh, users and developers. What does the Gini framework look like today? Well, Gini framework is a complete tool set with which you can build uh, anything from uh, web services, REST APIs, interactive uh, dashboards, all in pure Julia. In the framework itself, uh, there is many packages uh, which are divided as follows. On one hand, we have the Gini.jl package, which is the most famous one, which implements everything that has to do with the server, that is the backend, routing, everything. Then we have a reactive UI builder toolbox called Stipple. We also have an ORM to connect to databases, and then first-party plugins that provide features such as authentication. And on top of that, we have the Gini builder and Gini Cloud, which are no-code tools for enhanced productivity that I will introduce shortly. Now, uh, Gini, the, well, besides the Gini framework with its uh, low-code and full-code layers, in this last year, we have focused on developing no-code no -code tools, which has led to the release of Gini Builder. This Gini Builder is a VS Code plugin at the moment, that enables you to build your user interfaces visually with just drag and drop of components. Moreover, we have also released uh, Gini Cloud in, beta, in closed beta, which will be a platform to build your web applications and also deploy them with just one click, without having to worry about hosting or uh, DevOps stuff. Yeah, but uh, since Gini Cloud is uh, still in closed beta, we will not be using it for this uh, workshop, since we want it to be as practical as possible. And well, as a fellow researcher myself, I know the pain points that we experience when we are trying to share our work uh, as a web application online. And 
And so we understand that uh, you are not, most of you are not web developers, and you shouldn't need to become a web developer in order to build a web app from your work. And so our aim with all this node out cooling is to abstract away all of the complexity when it comes to web frameworks and streamline your workflows so that you can focus on what's more important, which is your work. And well, some of you might be familiar with other frameworks in the Julia space, and you might be asking, how does Gini compare to them? Uh, let's say, for instance, Dash and Shiny, which are some of the most uh, widely used. Uh, I can say, in comparison, that uh, well, Gini is a full-stack framework, and therefore you can build pretty much anything with it, from, as I said, APIs, web services, interactive dashboards, uh, connect to databases, then we also offer a no-code editor for free, which is increase, an increase in productivity. And an important thing is that Gini framework has been Julia native since its inception and in its design. And therefore, it's optimized for the Julia ecosystem. And finally, to finish with this intro introduction, uh, both Cynthia and I will be here at JuliaCon the whole week. So if you want to catch up and talk about anything, please. Just uh, reach out. If you decide to give Gini a try or are working already on something or need help, we have a Discord community with a help forum where we will promptly help you out in uh, any way we can. And if at your company are working on a project that uh, has to do with web development and you believe that you could use some help in accelerating the development, please reach out and we would be glad to uh, talk to you about collaboration. All right, and now let's start with the workshop, with the coding part. In this workshop, we will build a multi-page data app, okay, which will include uh, several pages. One of them for exploratory data analysis of the Boston housing data set. Another one uh, with a setup uh, for configuring a machine learning model and training it on the Boston Housing dataset. And a third one for serving the machine learning model as an API. This is the outline that we will follow. I will start with an introduction to reactive user interfaces. And then we will implement each one of the pages as a standalone application, where we will cover a few different aspects in each one, such as uh, tables and plugs, the importing of uh, code and UI controls, routing, and API documentation. And then once we have finished uh, building these three apps, we put them all together into the multi-page app and deploy it online. Uh, before we start, uh, well, we are just to give, share some resources about where you can learn more about Gini. We are working on a new documentation website which you can find uh, learn.giniframework.com. And we also have where well, Adrian, published a book about the web development with Gini, which is available on PACT. So, uh, yeah, about the workflow, as I said before, the, I would like this to be an interactive workshop where you code along with me. So, all the necessary code that will be used is available on the slides, which are accessible on this line, on this uh, link, at giniworkshop.nlify.app and uh, set up and materials, as I said before, on this GitHub repository. If you have any doubts throughout the workshop, uh, please ask. You can just raise a hand and I will I try to help you out. Okay, so uh, to get started, let's first uh, take a look at uh, what is a reactive web application. When developing a data app, the workflow can be summarized in four steps, more or less. The first one of which is the algorithm development, where we define some routines for data analysis and processing. Next, we have some preliminary result analysis, where we examine some of the results and then fine tune the algorithms in order to improve the results that we have obtained. Once we are happy with these uh, results, we might move on to building an app interface about our algorithms so that 
we make it easier to do reruns of the experiments, generate better visualizations, and control the experiments. Note that this does not need to be a user interface. It can be a simple uh, command line interface with a configuration file that allows you to just run things with a few comments or clicks. Now, once the interface is finished, it comes time to share our app with other people, which is the, well, what we call deployment, which in this case, it could be uploading it to an online service or just sending it as a zip or deploying it on a GitHub repository. In all this workflow, Genie comes into play in pretty much every step since it is a full stack web framework and it can implement server side logic to handle databases, pull data from other sources, interact with web services, or even expose part of our algorithms to the web via an API. Moreover, it provides UI building tools to, for visualization and to interact with Julia code, which comes in handy when building the app interface. And finally, by turning our uh, data analysis code into web application, it makes it easier to share with others with just a single link. Um, but in this workshop, we'll mainly focus on steps three and four. We will assume that we already have the scientific code and we want to package it into a web application and deploy it somewhere. So what is a uh, reactive application? Well, in a reactive app, the user interacts with the application via a user interface with some buttons, sliders, and some other types of controls. Now, with each user inter interaction, uh, the application executes some code that manipulates the underlying data, and this manipulation, the result of this manipulation, is reflected promptly in the user interface. And the important thing to remark is that all of this happens without a page reload. That is, the user interacts, and we see the result instantly without having to send a new request to the web server. This is an example of a simple web application where I can type in a sentence and it gives me the vowel count of the sentence. And as you can see, this is all in real time without any reloads. The user does not know whether it is running locally or on a remote web server anywhere. And well, the parts of a reactive application can be uh, divided in four parts. First, the data analysis, which is the code that performs the data analysis and processing. Next, we have the reactive variables, which are a type of variables that monitor their own status to watch for changes. And when a change is produced, they send a notification to other components in the application in order to keep uh, every component up to date with the latest status of the variable. Associated with these reactive variables, we have the reactive handlers, which are code snippets that are executed when the value of a reactive variable changes. And finally, we have the UI components, which is what the user interacts with. These components can be bound to a reactive variable so that when a change is made in the user interface, let's say a click of a button, moving a slider, the associated reactive variable is changed in the background instantly. So this has two-way communication, and in the same way, if something is changed in the background, the front end will be also uh, refreshed with the new value instantly. So uh, how do we actually implement the reactive web applications in Gini? Here we have the code for the example app I showed earlier, where well, this is the simplest form of a reactive application. We can get much more complicated, but for simple dashboards, this is sufficient. And we usually organize Gini apps into two files. One of them, the, we usually call app.jl, holding the logic of the application, and another one, which we usually call ui.jl, that implements the user interface. Now, if we look at the app.jl file for the logic more closely, we will see the following. We see that the logic is all enclosed in a module, which is this module will be loaded when the app is launched. Next, we import the Gini framework package, which includes everything from the server to everything required to implement the user interface. After that, we define the data analysis code 
This code can be defined in here or in another file and then included, as usually in, in Julia including. And then we implement the reactive code. Note that this reactive code here, delimited by the block defined by the app macro, this code is not executed instantly when the app is loaded. It is only instantiated when a request is made to the app, that is, when the browser accesses the application. So that each user that accesses the application will have its own code, so its own copy of this code. In this reactive code, we define the reactive variables, starting with an input variable to store the message that is typed. Uh, the tag in, or the macro in, indicates that it is read right, so that it takes its value from the UI. It can be written to from the UI. Next, we have other type of uh, read-only uh, reactive variables, which only output values to the UI. Any change made in the UI will be not reflected in the backend. And after that, we implement the handlers to watch the, well, the handlers with the unchanged macro. This macro will watch the variable message for changes, that is when a new letter is typed into the box. And when its value changes, uh, the vowel counter will be executed. The value of vowels will be updated, and this will be automatically reflected in the interface. Finally, we have the page macro, which defines uh, a route that is a path at the URL associated to a view file that will be rendered when the browser accesses this page. When it comes to the user interface, uh, Gini uses a low-code API with which you can implement the UI in pure Julia. Notice that earlier I mentioned that UI.gl could be a different file. We can also have it in a function and pass it to the page macro so that everything is in the same file. This is useful, useful for uh, small applications. Now, the, the, the calls in this uh, low-code API, each one of them generates the HTML code corresponding to a HTML component, because in the end, it all has to be rendered in the browser. So we have the text field, uh, P for paragraph, B for break, and the long list. When it comes to uh, interactive components, let's say the text field, uh, in order to bind the component to a variable, a reactive variable, we pass to it a symbol representing the variable to which we want to bind it. And when it comes to uh, displaying variables, so displaying uh, yeah, information on the UI, we can use the double mustache syntax in order to display variables that are typed in between the two brackets. Also, take into account that this uh, mustache syntax also accepts uh, JavaScript expression, so that if we want to, let's say, multiply a variable or something, we can do it right here. We can also use the typical Julia interpolation syntax, but this is only evaluated at page load time, so any modification of a variable that is made afterwards will not be reflected in the UI. Uh, now, as I said, this uh, low-code API, it generates HTML code uh, under, under it. So uh, let's take a look at what the HTML code would look like for this uh, small example. And we see that, well, the UI components are implemented with uh, standard HTML tags. Uh, in order to bind a component to a variable, we use the BIM model um, parameter. And note that the com reactive components that Gini uses start with the Q prefix. And this indicates that they come for the Quasar framework, which is a Vue.js uh, JavaScript framework. Now, um, some of you might like to write HTML, some others might prefer the low-code API, and some others might prefer to write no code at all when it comes to the user interfaces. And for that, we have uh, Gini Builder, which is a VS Code plugin in which you can build your user interfaces with just drag and dropping. Here we have, uh, for instance, uh, the list of components. We can set the layout of the page, mm, add understanding random components now, but you can add charts, etc. And you can preview it right, right here in the, in the builder itself. There's also a, sort of a CSS property editor, so you don't have to write any CSS. And we even have a AI system feature where you can use it for styling. 
most your yeah, or to add new variables, etc. Uh, I will be showing this later, but this is just a, a, well, a first approach. Now, if you have already installed the Gini Cloud, sorry, Gini Builder extension, I would ask that you uh, click on Start Server because it might take a few minutes to start, so that we have it running for when we need it. Also, I want you to keep in mind that it's still under active development, so there might be some bugs, but for uh, simple dashboards, it works very well. And I would like that if you like it and give it a try, please give us some feedback so that we can improve it further. Okay. Okay. All right, so now let's get started with the first page of our uh, multi-page application. Here we will implement an application that will load the Boston housing dataset from a CSV file. Then it will show some plots with uh, statistic, statistical information about the data and also display the data in a table. If you look at the code that's uh, in the download from the GitHub repository, you will see that, uh, well, we have a main folder called app and then three subfolders. We will implement each page in one, each one of these subfolders individually so that they can be run individually as well. And the data and the machine learning model that we will see later will be host safe in a folder at the top in order to avoid data duplication. Now, this is the template that we will use for the app.gl file in this case and for the UI.jl file. You can see it's a standard, uh, follows the same structure I showed before. We just load the data, and here we will implement the reactive code. Yes, now um, let, me, let me show you how to run a Gini app, because this will be necessary. Uh, if we open um, in VS Code, a new terminal. Mm. This is on um, this first part. We will not be using Gini Builder. This is as you would run it from the terminal itself. Okay. So we would open just the terminal in the folder, launch a Julia REPL. And then just uh, import the Gini framework package, load the app, and start up a server, which is as easy as this. And yeah, Gini, a Gini server will start, and after this, we can start developing. Okay, first, uh, during this uh, part, I will explain first the code itself, and then I will do the implementation by hand. So you can follow along, you can copy and paste the code from the slides, as uh, well, however you, you feel like. Now, uh, for the exploratory data analysis application, the, most, well, the main component is plotting. In Gini, we use Plotly for the plots. So let me just introduce how to, to plot with Plotly. Uh, given some uh, vector-based data, like we see here, a Plotly plot is composed of two components, which is a trace that holds the data that will be displayed on the plot, that is the lines or the dots, and a layout, which sets the general uh, look of the plot and the things like axis, other properties. Then we call the plot function with the trace and the layout, and we should see something like the plot we have here. Uh, for plotting in Gini, it's pretty much the same. So what we have to do is define the trace and the layout as reactive variables, tackled with the auto macro, in order to expose them to the UI. This will be in the logic file, in the UI, sorry, in the app.jl. With the small difference that in this case the trace is actually a vector of trace of calls to a trace generator from Plotly. Here we can have things like scatter, histogram, a line, anything, but all arranged in a vector. And, oops, sorry, that we also, um, well, we have to prefix the layout by the plot, with the Plotly-based prefix in order to avoid clashes with the Gini framework layout. When it comes to the UI, 
we use the we have the plot generator which takes the trace and the layout as parameters and it will display the plot on the UI. So let's start with the first plot. In this case, we will add a scatter plot where we use the scatter call with some parameters passed to it. And we see that this is a scatter call takes uh, for its data that's going to be plot. It can take uh, columns from a data frame, which is the data frame that we loaded earlier. Moreover, uh, in the trace itself, in the trace itself, set uh, parameters like the markers, colors, or uh, layers. Then, in the well, we have the layout, which is uh, simple enough. And when it comes to the UI, we are placing the the plot with a small header on top of it. And we place all of this inside of a cell container. A cell is essentially an HTML div. And in order to pass multiple uh, elements to be contained within this cell, we pass them as a vector of um, low API calls. Let me just show you really quick how this will look like in, the, in our EDA application. Here, I replaced the reactive call block with the reactive variables for the traces and the layout. I click Save. And then for the UI, I place it right before the header. So if we open a browser window, All right, we see that the plot is already there and we can play with it. And notice that uh, we don't have to restart the app or anything. I just pasted the code and it automatically reloads as we see in the message down here. Um, okay, next, uh, also, yeah, notice that uh, we are using uh, CSS classes to install the components. These classes, um, well, they have the ST classes that are provided by Gini, and the other classes that are call, row, etc., that are provided by the Bootstrap and Quasar frameworks. Well, besides this uh, scatter plot, we would like to add a histogram plot, which is added in the same way, except for that uh, in the logic file we would call the histogram call, and yeah, the, the, for the UI it would be the same workflow. Next, for the box plot, we use the box call, and again, we will have a plot. Now, for the last element of this user interface, we have the data table to display the data set. In order to implement the data table, we need a reactive variable of type data table. That's, uh, we will hold the data. This data table will be instantiated from a data frame, so you have the data frame anywhere in your app, you can directly import it here. And also we have another variable, sorry, yeah. Uh, the data, this data table um, type is provided by the Gini and it has added uh, some fields such as data columns and rows. This is uh, important, I mention it now because it will be used later in the no-code editor. Now the pagination, uh, well, there's uh, another reactive variable for pagination which limits the number of rows that are displayed in the data table. Uh, when it comes to the user interface, in order to display this table on the page, we use the call uh, table, which we prefix with Gini framework in order to avoid conflicts with the plotly-based table. And we see that we just pass to it the data table object as a first argument, then some other styling parameters, and the pagination, um, pagination uh, variable as a parameter. So let me try, let me uh, add all of these components, the two plots and the table to the, to the page. Okay. 
Okay, so now we are the trace for the histogram to the UI. We add it in the same uh, row component as the scatter plot. You can see it appear to the right. Same for the box plot. It's trace and layout, and then again for the UI, we add it. Uh, um, right next to the other two plots. Okay, cool, now it's time to add the, the data ray table. And we will add the table to the UI in a new row enclosed in another new column. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, so as you can see, this is our exploratory data analysis uh, application. We have a functioning table with uh, functioning plots. And it was pretty straightforward to build. Just uh, define some reactive variables, define the corresponding components in the UI, and you are done. Now I will give you a, I will show you how to do this with Gini Builder which will be uh, pretty much easier. Okay, so if you want to try it along with me, what we need to do first is uh, go to the app.jl and uncomment this last line where uh, notice that before we were using the ui.jl as a view file for this route. Now we will use an HTML page as the route. So once we have changed this, we can start up the app from uh, Gini Builder in the uh, Gini Apps tab. And this will launch the app with the no code editor. It might take a while to load, so please be patient. All right, so let's just quickly do the same work provided before with the low-code API. We first set the layout with some uh, rows and columns of the plots. We can now delete the predefined content in each column. We click Save. We add the three, oh sorry, some headers first. Um, yeah, now let's start with the uh, reactive components. We can add the same type of uh, plot for all of them since we will set the type of plot in the backend, as I will show before, well, I will show now. Finally, we add the data table. And Okay, if we save this, and we take a look at the HTML that's been generated. We see that, well, it's the HTML for the page with some mockup data for the plots. We can preview this right here by clicking on the monitor uh, icon. Okay, you see, it's filled with mockup data. So now what we need to do is bind these components to the logic that we have written in the app.jl file. This is Pretty straightforward, we just go component by component, click on the data binding, in this case this will be the trace, 
for the histogram, well, sorry, not the histogram, the scatter plot, scatter trace, scatter layout. The same for the histogram. Okay, I think I missed. Yeah, I will add the box plot here. Uh, box trace, box layout. And then for the data table, as I mentioned before, for data binding, we need to set the, the housing data dot data, and also the columns and pagination. So for the columns, and for the pagination, As you can see, we could use a search bar, which is uh, what we are actually going to include in the next version. But yeah, the pagination can be found right here. And that's it. We could save. Let's try to refresh this. And we have a uh, user interface built with drag and drop without having to write any single line of uh, UI code. All right, now that we have uh, finished with the ADA page, uh, let's switch on to the machine learning model training page. Uh, what time is it? Should we need to do a break later? Is it time for a break? No? That's okay. okay. Uh, okay, let me stop the, uh, the EDA app first. And let's go back to the slides. Now, once we have uh, explored the data, it's time to train a machine learning model on this data to make some predictions. Uh, the typical workflow when developing a machine learning application, it can be summarized in four steps where the first one is, okay, we pre-process the data in order to clean it up, remove all layers, normalize it, extract features, etc. Next, we choose a machine learning model and so choose some parameters for it and instantiate it. After that, we train the model in order to teach it to make, to make predictions for this data. And finally, we test the model uh, to assess its accuracy on previously unseen data. This will be a linear workflow for which a web interface will be the perfect medium to interact with, since it would allow us to uh, interact with the data at various points, such as in the input or in, at the output, and also to add controls to fine tune the workflow and rerun the experiment and training processes. Let's say, for instance, that uh, we have uh, some code for training a machine learning model, a neural network, in this case, on the Boston housing data set to predict the median value of the houses in this data set. We could have uh, a script that executes this workflow, where we first import some routines from a module hosted in a different file, we load this data, we split the data into training and testing data sets, some set some parameter values, such as the number of layers, the number of uh, training samples, and the number of epochs for the training, and then we call a training function for the neural network that will return the train and test errors, as well as the train model. Now, if we have this workflow and we wanted to share with uh, anyone else uh, turning it into a web application could be a very nice way to do it. And so, which is, this is what we will do. We will build a dashboard that will allow us to control the parameters of the training, such as the number of neurons per layer, the samples and epochs, and also to visualize the error in a plot, and to store the, training mo the trained model, so once we are satisfied with the settings, we can save it. I mean, ideally, um, the, the workflow here is, uh, okay, we have some data analysis code that has some inputs 
and give you some outputs. So we built a web application around it in order to control the inputs through a web interface and also visualize, visualize the output results. If you look at the code uh, from the GitHub repository, you will see in the, well, in the app slash uh, ML slash lib folder, there's the NN train module, which implements all of the routines for training the, the network. And this is the template that we will use for this, uh, for this application. Now, in this, uh, after, in this part, I will not be implementing the low-code um, low user interface. I will still explain it, but I will just do the, the Gini Builder at the end in order to keep it uh, more dynamic. So this is the template that we have. We load the data, and again, we have to implement the reactive parts. And here for the UI, we start with a simple header and the column for the parameters that are controlled with the sliders. Let's start with the, with the sliders. Uh, well, since the sliders are all input arguments from the UI onto the, yeah, onto the uh, backend, we define them as in, with the tag with the in macro, since they need to be writable. Notice that uh, in the case of the layer networks parameter, it is an array, which is uh, fine, since we can then bind it so that we only modify the values for the hidden layers of the networks, since the first and the last network cannot be changed, or should not be changed. And after these three parameters, in the UI, we would just uh, use a call to the slider generator, which takes uh, the value range as parameter, and then the parameter, sorry, the variable to be bounded. In this case, we use the symbol generator in order to generate a symbol that binds the component to the second element of the layer neuron, layer, layer neurons vector. We do the same for the third layer, for the third entry, and again for the number of uh, drawing samples and epochs. Then, um, yeah, what we want to have is a train button. So training buttons are uh, implemented as, as follows. Um, a button, when we push it, we want something to happen. So we require a variable that is toggled when its uh, state is changed by clicking it. Moreover, since this is a training, this triggers the training of the neural network, we want to disable this button while the network is training. And so we add a second variable called training to indicate whether the network is training or not. When it comes to the user interface, we use the BTN generator, which takes as parameters uh, the action to be executed when the button is clicked. In this case, the code for this action is implemented by the click macro, which takes as a valid argument a string with a valid JavaScript expression. In this case, this is JavaScript, but could be anything because it's simple toggling of the train variable in order to trigger the training of the, of the network. Um, yeah, and then we have the loading parameter to disable the button while training. Now that we have the controls for the, for the training process, which is the main call, it's time to actually implement the, the handler and the process itself. For it, we first need to define three additional variables, which are the ones that will be uh, keeping the result of the training, that is the errors and the traces for the plots. We also define uh, a neural network model instantiated with some initial values, and we tag it as private since we don't actually want to expose it, expose it to the UI, but we want to, to make it private because it's not necessary to have it visible from the browser. Uh, we also put it here instead of having it as a global variable because we want each user that accesses the application to have its own model. Otherwise, there will be clashes between several users trying to train the same model. Now, uh, for the actual handler, which watches the train variable, uh, these are the actions that it implements. What it does is 
it disables the button while it is running. Next, it uh, splits the data. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, it splits the data into training and test using the parameter that was selected in the slider that we defined before. Then it launches the training process again using the parameters from the sliders and storing the results in the output variables for the for the error. Anytime these variables are written to, their values will be transferred to the front end and whatever is using them in the front end will be updated. Then we have the traces, which uh, are updated with the new errors. And this is it for the handler of the train uh, button. Of course, now that we have uh, finished the training, we want to have the error plot, for which we only need to add the layout, since we had the, um, the trace before in the previous slide. And for the user interface, again, just a simple call to the plot function with the trace and the layout. And since we want to save the model, once the training has finished, we just add a new button with a new save variable. That is the one that we will toggle when the button is clicked. And the handler that saves the model as a JLD, in JLD2 format. And now let me uh, implement all of this uh, using uh, Gini Builder. First, uh, we start the, the app, and also we need, well, we don't need to, but we could open a terminal in the app folder. Okay, let me start by adding the, the reactive code for the sliders. Oh, yeah. I forgot to change the view from Julia. Okay, here we have it. Uh, apologies for this uh, interruption. I must have probably added some comma or anywhere that shouldn't be there, which obviously makes the code not work. But as we can see, we had more time to actually look at what was going wrong. Uh, the design itself, the visual design of the user interface was pretty straightforward with the setting of the, the bindings for each component and everything. And now we can just reload the UI that I, I copied and pasted, which is also a cool feature. If we had some example UI written in HTML, we can just paste it here and load it into the no-code editor and make it work. And yeah, so this is it for the for the neural network training dashboard. Now I think it would be a good time to take a five, 10 minute break. So uh, feel free to leave the room or uh, whatever you want. And we will continue in, yeah, at uh, 2.40. Okay, so we might continue. Uh, at this point, we can stop, uh, if you have it running, you can stop uh, Gini Builder as we will not be using it anymore. Also, let's open the entire uh, workspace for the multi-page app that we have cloned from GitHub. Also, if someone's on Windows, somebody just told me I forgot about this, you might have had some trouble running the apps because they are symbolic links for the data and model folders. In that case, you just need to uh, copy and paste the, the data into the <laughs> corresponding folder. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so yeah, we start with the, in this, in this third part, we start with the workspace for the multi-page app. We will take on the 
API um, application. Just uh, open a terminal in here. Yeah, if you have not instantiated the packages before, just do so now. And let's switch back to some more slides. Yeah, so now that we have now that we have trained uh, the machine learning model, it is time to serve it online as an API. Now some words about the uh, REST APIs. Uh, a REST API provides a structured and a standardized way to expose functionalities and data from our applications to the internet, thus making it easier to integrate with other systems. The REST part in a REST API means uh, representing representational state transfer, which is that the server does not save any information between successive requests. That is, if I make a request to an API and then I make another, the server does not store any information between them to identify me. And so machine learning models are a perfect candidate for being served over an API as what they do is typically they receive some features or data from the user and they return a prediction. So there's no data to keep in between predictions. Uh, in order to implement an API engine, what we need to do is implement a series of endpoints with one endpoint for resource that we want, resource that we want to expose. Each endpoint requires the following. First, a route, like the one we have here, defined with the route function, uh, that defines the URL path to access the resource, the parameters that it takes, uh, which is defined here as a symbol, the handler, which is the function that will process this request and return the response, and the method to access this resource, which is usually get, it all of the information is contained in the URL or post if uh, the header of the request contains some more information. Now, in this case, for the handler, we defined a simple function that examines the parameters that are in the URL with the params function and returns a simple hello, whatever name we have put in here in the URL. When the user accesses this through a browser, they will see, if, I, if it was me, I would see hello pair on the browser window. And let me remark that a web API, of course, is not a reactive application since there's no interactivity, no UI components or anything. It's just a, it could be classified as a web service. Now for the API part, we will use this template where we simply import the data that we have normalized before and the, the machine learning model that we have saved in the dashboard implemented before. Also note that we are importing some uh, Swagger packages that I will explain later what they are used for. So. Let's proceed with the implementation of the first endpoint of our API. Um, we will start with the reload endpoint since the user can save many um, models one, once over and again. We want to be able to reload the latest model. To do so, we define a route. And nowadays that in this case we don't define the handler function, but we do it through the, uh, through the do end syntax. So let me just do it. Uh, ah, well, let me uh, show now next uh, the other endpoint that we will have, which is the predict endpoint. In this endpoint, the, we just provide a house ID via the URL, and the API will return a prediction for the median value of this house. Here we have the handler, which is this predict function that extracts the data for the specified house in the ID via the parameters and returns the prediction made by the model for this house. Notice that the, 
the response given by this handler is in JSON format, which is a typical format uh, provided by, well, used in REST APIs. Then we define the route, which is simply the path in the URL, and the parameter to indicate the ID of the house. We can uh, type, add a type to the parameters in typical Julia syntax. In this case, we set it as an integer. Um, so yeah, let me, let's see what this will look like implemented in our code. Okay, so as I said before, please open a, a terminal in the API folder. Uh, don't launch the app yet. We will first uh, write the code for it. Here we add the route for the reload endpoint. And next, the code for the predict endpoint. So we see that we have two routes. API reload and API predict. So let's test this out in a browser. Let's press save and launch the app. Okay. Okay, we see that we have nothing at the root, so we get this uh, 404 message with the site Gini. And let's go to the API reload. Okay, model reloaded, it works. And let's try to make a prediction. For the house number four. This will call the neural network model, and we receive uh, the medium value in JSON format for the prediction. Now, um, when do we have a lot of uh, this, this is a simple app with just two endpoints, but let's say we have dozens or uh, hundreds of endpoints. It can be a little bit difficult to discover all of them. And so a documentation page for the endpoints can be quite useful. In this case, uh, we can use a pretty standard tool that's used in a lot of places called Swagger. To document our endpoints with Swagger, oh, sorry, I'm not uh, on the slides. To document our endpoints with Swagger, all we have to do is add a doc string for each route in the application with Swagger macro and Swagger will automatically generate a documentation page. Now, this doc string needs to follow a specific format where we specify the parameters that it takes, a description for the endpoint, and responses, for instance. And we can add many more parameters that are available in the Swagger documentation. And after we have uh, documented each endpoint with a doc string, we configure the documentation page with some uh, information, such as API version or uh, a title, etc. that can be said via this dictionary here. Then we build the documentation page, calling the build function for Swagger, and render it with the render Swagger function. We assign the result of this render Swagger function to a UI function. This will be a string in HTML, a string of HTML of the entire HTML page. And so we pass this UI function onto the page macro, and we assign it to the API uh, route or path. Note that here we pass the nothing as an argument in order to indicate that we don't want to use the default layout that Gini has. That is, uh, as you have, we have seen so far, when we are uh, writing our user interfaces, we only write the body of the HTML page. We don't touch the header at all. Which, that is because uh, Gini does that automatically. It, it injects a header onto whatever we write. In this case, Swagger generates a full, complete 
uh, web page, and so we don't want to add any layout on top of it. And now let's see, uh, yeah, once we uh, have this, we would have a page that looks like this, and I will show you now how to do it. First, we add the, the comments. for the reload endpoint. And for the predict endpoint. Okay. In this case, we have to reload the model in order to have it execute these uh, new additions. Oh, sorry, I forgot to add the actual generation of the page. Yes. We add it here near the end. Okay. And let's see the browser again. Now if we head over to the API we see the the documentation for the API where we have an explore bar we can look look for uh, any endpoints we also can interact with the endpoints individually and we can even try them out for through this form where here we can type in the for the predict Endpoint, we can type in an ID for house, we click execute, and we instantly get the response. And yeah, this would be very useful for, uh, for discoverability when we publish our app online, especially for people who want to integrate our model or our application into their own systems. And this is it for the, for the API which as you have seen is uh, pretty straightforward, just define, oh, yeah. Yes. Um, sorry, can you repeat again? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I added it myself with the, sorry. Let me show you. It's here. There's, uh, here I commented, well, let me show you on the code. What is it? Yeah, here I documented each one of the endpoints. First, the reload one, so that, uh, and then the one for the prediction. And when Swagger builds the documentation page, they will show up here. Okay. And I, maybe we can try the reload one. Sorry? Yeah. It's associated with the route, with the route function. Okay, it needs to be, yeah, all this Swagger macro needs to be used right before the route. Yes, if you use it anywhere else, it will not take any effect. It needs to be a, because I, I mean, I don't know the inner workings of it, but I guess it looks for a route like afterwards and plugs it in. Because actually, as you can see, yeah, let me just stop here. But yes, you need to put it right before the route. And uh, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, is that YAML? Yeah, that's YAML. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, there's uh, quite extensive uh, documentation about how to configure it, and there's uh, plenty of parameters. But yes, it's, uh, it's in YAML. All right, so let's uh, continue with the second to last part of the workshop, where we will uh, turn our uh, 
three different apps into one single multi-page application. Now, in order to build, uh, well, as I said, uh, our definition of multi-page app is simply that uh, we have different routes where each route is associated with a different view. Okay, so there are different ways in which we could implement a multi-page app, which are, for instance, we could have a single app.jl with a single app block where we have all of the reactive code and everything, and then we simply have different routes defined with the app macro. This could be uh, useful for uh, simple applications, but yeah, when the number of pages grows, this can get uh, hard to manage quite fast. And then another option is to have a single app.gl for every page with the associated um, page uh, view for each page. And as you can see, for now we have used option two where we define each uh, app separately with its own app.jl and its own ui.jl and it also allows for better organization. So, um, yeah, this is the structure. If you look at the structure of the, for, of the um, code that we downloaded, like uh, here in the VS Code window, we see in the Explorer, we see that we have uh, three folders, one for each app, and then at the top, a single app.jl, okay? This app.jl is the one that will import the pages from each subfolder or each page in order to put them all together. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. All you have to do in order to uh, combine multiple pages into an app is include and import the modules from each app. Recall that uh, in the, when we implemented each app, all of the logic was enclosed in a module and we gave each module a different number according to the app, right? So we just uh, import the module for each page, and then we bind each uh, module to a route. Okay, for instance, for the EVA, we call the page macro with the route, with the path for the URL, the view that will be rendered at this URL, a layout file that I will introduce uh, after this slide, and then the model, sorry, the module that will be bound to this uh, page, to this route. And the same for the ML. And in the case of the API, uh, since we don't use the layout, and we will see now why. Also, it is also recommended to delete or overwrite any routes that might have been created when we imported the code for the sub applications. Because when we import this, uh, this might create any additional uh, route. So in this case, we just uh, overwrite the root route uh, to redirect to the EDA page when we access the multi-page application. So uh, once we have uh, imported all of the pages separately, we could access them by individually accessing each one of routes. But this is not a very, uh, let's say, comfortable way to access your uh, your pages, and for this we would like to have a navigation bar to enable us to navigate between pages, especially between the ADA and ML pages. Uh, for the API docs, we consider that uh, we just, when we click on the API, this will open in a new window, in a new tab, without the navigation bar on top. And so we implement this uh, navigation bar as a layout. Now, in Gini, layouts, uh, well, yeah, layouts are used for adding common elements throughout all of the pages so that they have a consistent structure. In this case, a navigation bar at the top. Uh, if we look at the code for the layout, which we include here in the page, the code for the view will be this here, where we see first a lot of uh, styling options to uh, make it look uh, decent and stay at the top. Uh, all of this uh, CSS, we could be putting it in a different, in a separate CSS file, but I just kept it here for uh, visibility. But if we just look uh, over, over it, we see that what we do is define uh, three links, one for each page of the application with some uh, name for the link, okay? And then, the and this would be for the layout file. Okay, we have the code for the 
navigation bar, and then what the layout file does is it includes the view that is associated with the page. That is, for this first EDA page, the call to page will include this view at app slash EDA slash UA.gl. Notice that here we have the agile macro that what this one does is it injects the view into this uh, page call. And then we also have a parameter called model where this model refers to the app block that was defined in each one of these modules for each page. This uh, app block is uh, automatically extracted by the page macro and passed onto this uh, page function that is executed inside of the, of the view file. Okay. Now, just for uh, curiosity, uh, if we want to do this in HTML, I think I have it uh, so Okay, I don't have it here, but it's in, if you want to look it in the complete code of the, of the app, uh, you can find the same version for the HTML where you will see that we would define the navigation bar with HTML, which in some cases might be easier because this can be quite complicated. And then uh, we can execute Julia code right in the HTML. We, can, we call it the exact same page function. And you can see this in the full application at the GitHub repository in the main branch. So let's uh, try to uh, implement this uh, navigation bar and multi-page application. So first we add the, we switch back to VS Code. Okay, we have here. Yeah, let me exit the, the API app. Switch back to the root folder. Launch uh, Julia Ripple. And go and edit the app.jl file. Here I will just copy and paste the code I showed you before where we import the modules of each page and define browse for them and create a new file uh, called layout.jl. With the contents of the navigation bar and the inclusion of the view for each page. Now let's launch the application. This is uh, bigger than the other two we have implemented, so it might take a little longer to load, but yeah, it's already loaded. And if we open it, Yeah, we have our app with our multiple pages. Now, this is one way to do this. We also support uh, tabs in, um, in Genius, so you, we could have a page, sorry, an app with multiple pages implemented with tabs, which has the advantage that the switching between pages would be instant since there's no reload between them, but it's a little more cumbersome to implement. And if we go to the API, as well, we have it right here in the new tab. Oh, sorry, and yeah, and this loaded because I uh, reverted some uh, changes before, but what, what matters here is the navigation bar on top. 
And yeah, this is it for the multi-page application that we had to implement. As you can see, the process has not been uh, that difficult. We have implemented each page separately as individual applications and then put them together with the navigation bar. Mm, there could be, a, in case of, uh, let's say we have uh, thousands of pages, we might need to find a different workflow and a different organization for the pages. But for now, uh, when it comes to, let's say, simple pages with uh, just a couple of pages with dashboards and an API, this is uh, the recommended way to implement. And finally, for the last part of the workshop, we will uh, look at deployment of this uh, application. Now, uh, before we proceed to deployment, let me introduce the topic of uh, containerization, where containerization is a lightweight form of uh, virtualization that uh, what it does is it encapsulates an application with these dependencies into standalone executable packages. Some of its uh, benefits are isolation, in that an app running within a container is isolated from other applications running on the same machine, so there are no conflicts between them. Also, the fact that it includes all of the dependencies is a benefit. Portability, as I said, uh, it encapsulates everything the application needs to run, so you can just plop it anywhere where the container runs, and it will work. Scalability, there might be cases in which an application cannot handle the load because it's receiving too many requests. So in that case, we could spin up a new container to help this application handle the excess requests. And finally, uh, deployment demand. Uh, containerization solves the historical problem of, but it runs on my computer. Why does nothing run on yours? So, well, in this case, since we have a container, it runs on mine, it runs on yours, it runs everywhere. When it comes to uh, Gini apps, the recommended way to uh, deploy a Gini app is to package it into a container and deploy it on a web platform. Uh, for this, Docker is the most commonly used um, technology, which makes uh, container creating straightforward thanks to its uh, Docker file blueprint. More advances are uh, possible with this use of Docker since you can also integrate other services like uh, databases or any other backend services just within the same container. And we should keep in mind that uh, since Julia uses uh, quite a lot of memory, when it comes to uh, using uh, deploying Julia containers, this will have a higher uh, resource usage which might result in higher costs. So for uh, Gini app, we provide a template, which you can also find on the GitHub repository, for the creation, creation of a Docker container. It follows the standard structure where we start from the standard uh, Julia image provided by the Julia organization. In this case, I think this one includes the latest version. And we do some uh, stuff to create a Julia user, etc. But the important parts here are that we pre install, when creating the image, we pre install all of the packages and we pre compile them so that when the image or the container is run, it does not have to install and pre compile anything so that it actually starts faster. Because as we know, pre compilation in Julia is, uh, well, it can take quite a long time. And also, uh, we have uh, that the entry point, which is what is executed once the container is finished starting, this is simply a launching of the of the Genie application with the comments I've shown before. Besides this, we have other uh, parameters like uh, setting whether we are in the um, production or development environment, which changes some options when loading the Genie app, and also assigning the default part for the, for the app. In this case, we had 8,000, 8, it could be any other. So, uh, if you would like to uh, run uh, this Docker image locally, what you could do is first install Docker, and then place the Docker file at the top of the root folder where the app.jl is located, build the Docker image with the Docker build command, and we give it a tag in this case, it has the tag multi-page, that is, we should give it a name to distinguish between different versions of the same container. 
and we spawn a container with the Docker run command, where we bind the port 8000 on our computer to the port 8000 on the container, so that when we access uh, this port on our local machine, it will redirect us to the container. Yeah. And, uh, well, in, after we have uh, tried and tested the container on our local machine, the next step will be to uh, deploy it to uh, somewhere online. Now, um, there's those dozens of uh, deployment services. Mm, the one, uh, the most uh, I like the most is probably uh, Fly.io because it's pretty easy to, uh, to deploy there. All you have to do is first open an account there, install the uh, common line interface, it's called uh, FlyCTL, place the Docker file at the top of the root folder, uh, open a terminal, go there, and run Fly Launch. It will give you some instructions on the terminal. I will show this now. And then uh, one important thing to keep into account is that we need to scale up the machine that is running the, the container because, as I said, Julia is pretty uh, resource hungry. And yeah, with this, uh, the Fly.io service will take care of the building and deploying the image and giving you a URL to access your application. So let me just give you a quick demo of how this would work. And my terminal. Well, doesn't matter. I do a fly CTL, fly launch. It will give me. I choose a server where I want it to be deployed. Okay, I tell it. Okay, and then I do fly CTL deploy. And it will build an image submitted to the Fly.io servers. And after that, we can, well, what did I do? Yeah, it's not a, sorry, I made a mistake. Okay, I was in the wrong branch, sorry about that. Uh, again, name already taken. Okay, nice. No, no. Yes, deploy now. Okay, so given the Docker file, it reads the Docker file, builds the image, and puts it up on the fly.io server, and then we can just uh, head over there. Where does the... At the dashboard, and we see our deployed application. Where? In this case, for the workshop, we have deployed uh, yeah, our Julia app. So as you see, this last step, pretty easy. Now we also have the deployment on GiniCloud, which is even easier. But as I said, it's still in closed beta, so which is why we're, for now, just showcasing uh, how to use uh, OnFly.io. But if I might just give you a, a quick look of what it looks like. This is the main interface where we have uh, all of our apps. We could start a workspace, which is essentially a Gini Builder in the cloud. And then when, once we load an app, we could just deploy it with one click. And it's made accessible on an URL of the, yeah, with a specific name. All pretty easy in just one click. And with this, I think, yeah, I think we have come pretty much to the end of the workshop. Uh, I finished quite early, so if you don't mind, I would like to just give you a glimpse of some other things that you can build with Gini. Uh, first of all, we 
we, have, we are working on a new uh, documentation site. Uh, feel free to visit it after the conference and uh, give us some feedback or things uh, that you would like to see or uh, because uh, yeah, we are still building it and maybe you have some workflows that are not included here, so we would like to know more about your needs. Here in this app gallery, we have some examples of uh, things you can build. It's mainly based around dashboards, but some of them are uh, quite interesting. For instance, uh, this one with the Lorentz uh, simulation, which is a real-time simulation using uh, differential equations, where you can yeah, plot on real-time the Lorentz structure and change the parameters. And as you see, it is quite fast, considering that it's running in the browser in real time. So this is one possible use. And um, yeah, it's uh, pretty easy to set up. As another demo that we have is the, yeah, for another dashboard, typical dashboard is the Iris clustering uh, dashboard that runs uh, k-means clustering on the Iris dataset. And you can just change some parameters and it would, on live, uh, update the results in plots with the, yeah, with the clusters assigned, as well as, uh, and one last one is the traveling salesman demo, which is uh, based, well, it uses the jump package to run an optimization, convex optimization problem, okay, it solves the traveling salesman problem, which is finding the optimal route to travel between points on a map in, with the, minimum distance, and this one again runs here in uh, real time on a map, so I'm showing this because uh, mapping is a feature that many people have requested when it comes to uh, Gini apps, and yes, we can do uh, a map pretty easily. And so uh, I hope this, uh, this workshop has inspired you to uh, give Gini a try, maybe come up with uh, new users, new applications, you have some uh, applications that you would like to share, please do so, because we are really interested in seeing what uh, other people can build. And just, uh, we are, would be more than glad to add it to our gallery and showcase uh, with it. It's your research or your application. And if you need help with anything, please uh, ask. Uh, join our Discord, we'll be glad to help you out. And as uh, we said in the beginning, if your company is working on a project that involves uh, web applications, and you think you will benefit from some expert help, please reach out, and we are also here during JuliaCon, so yeah, we'll be more than glad to, uh, to connect with everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for attending the workshop. I hope uh, you learned something, and see you, see you next time. Sorry, sorry, yeah, I'm saying, okay, after this, uh, now we have plenty of time for questions and answers, so, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it seems like I was eager to finish, but no, no, I want to keep it going, uh, so yeah, any questions, answers, uh, we are here, please. Yeah, this is something that we have looked into, like we have uh, plot, Plotly. Uh, ideally, we could support uh, many other uh, JavaScript libraries, such as D3, for instance. We uh, have looked into uh, supporting Maki. We actually talked to the Maki guys, but we are still not moved on to that yet, because I know that. Are you asking about any specific library, or? Yeah, Maki, because that's uh, something that everyone is asking for. We, we would like to, to add this support, so. If you can ask the same for the Mackie guys, and hey, we would like this to be integrated with Gini, uh, we would like to talk to them again about this. Yes? Well, provided I have a little bit of experience with Geo.js and JavaScript, how, how busy is it, and how well documented and well supported is it for me to write my own components and integrate them into Gini? Yeah, I th well, I have not actually, I have to be honest, I have not tried that. Uh, but it is definitely possible to write your own components. We don't have the documentation for this yet, so it's something that we would have to uh, to look into and develop, because right now we use the Quasar components, but the idea when Adrian designed the, the Stipple package was that you could write your components as a plugin, uh, let's say a separate module, and then load it into a, 
into Stipple because let me just show you real quick. Actually, the, the components in Gini are provided by a package that's called Stipple UI. You see, so this actually what it does is implements all of the logic necessary to trans to convert the Quasar components onto, yeah, to, to plug them into Gini. So we would have to write something similar to this for any other framework or to write your own components. And in that case, yeah, but you are mentioning that, uh, okay, you would like to write them, let's say, in JavaScript and HTML and then plug them into uh, Gini, right? Yes. I think that uh, is uh, definitely doable because this is what we are doing here with uh, with Quasar. And, yeah. Yeah, you mean uh, dynamic uh, generation of uh, components or? Uh, yeah, I actually, we, I have a demo for that. I don't have it hosted anywhere, unfortunately, but what I have is a, a neural network editor where you can click a button and you add new layers with a slider to change the number of layers. And we also have a plot that it's updated with the new diagram of the new network. So yes, you can dynamically add components. And we also, we actually have uh, some, yeah, let me show you real quick one moment. Yeah, okay, sorry, it's not here, but yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, actually it's here. You just have to, uh, in this case, it's in uh, HTML, I did it in HTML, but you just need to do a loop for loop, and in each loop you add, uh, in this case, it was toggles, you just add a toggle. So yeah, you can dynamically alter the, the way your UI looks. You could also hide elements or display them depending on the values of some reactive variables. So pretty much, yeah, you can do a lot of things. Yes. Any uh, future support or current support for authentication? Uh, we actually already support authentication. Okay, uh, in the Gini framework, it does have support for authentication. Um, actually, we are working on it, on improving it. We also like to uh, include it into a Gini Builder to add authentication with just one click. But um, this is something that uh, we have, uh, the documentation on this part is still not very extensive. It involves uh, using databases, for instance, but it definitely uh, uses uh, authentication. As if we look at the website for the Gini framework, we see that at some point, I think, uh, we had, uh, yeah, the Gini plugins, we have Gini authentication. So we definitely have support for authentication. But it is something that I'm not that familiar with yet, with yet but uh, I can ask. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yes? I just want to comment on that, that actually the Gini authentication works really well even with Stipple. So when you have an intent to work with Stipple, you just use that plug and it works well together. And even without the database, you oh. can just use some files that can also Okay, th th thanks for, for letting me know that you tried with Stipple, yes. As I said, I haven't actually tried. I wanted to uh, add it to the workshop as a, let's say, stretch goal, but uh, I didn't have the time to, uh, to add it, but I would definitely, uh, you can tell me more about how you, do, how you did it later. What do you mean by separating, like they, they are defining different variables?
Okay, yeah, so you could construct a single plot object, let's say, with everything, yeah. That's, uh, actually this is, um, yeah, the, the reason for this is because earlier before we had our own API for steeple plots, it was called the steeple plots, in which we had the layout and the, the trace separate. I mean, under the hood, it was converting to plotly ob objects and stuff, so yeah, this is a carryover from that design. But yeah, as you can say, you can put it in everything in the same object and it would work. Okay, yes, go ahead. I, I believe you touched upon this at the beginning, uh, the support uh, for databases. Yes. Are you actually thinking about supporting this by steeple based uh, or best design of the JavaScript in databases? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's on the roadmap anytime soon. Like for now, we support uh, SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, but yeah, anything beyond that, we would need to see if there's a demand for that, what its users are, because as we said, we are definitely more than open to uh, work with the community and adding features, and if there's demand for uh, this kind of databases, then definitely we will be happy to work on it. But why do you ask, like, uh, what would be the use case for this that uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with them, so? Well, it's just because I work with community-based stuff, so it's complex and finding the complexity of uh, MySQL or Postgres or SQL seems like a better way. Yeah. And there are easier things for data that can be updated uh, online and database. In that case, would, uh, because we have an uh, ORM layer called uh, Searchlight, which allows you to interact with databases uh, using Julia objects, essentially. It's like you can persist your objects to the database and retrieve them without having to write any SQL lines. So maybe that could help uh, reduce the complexity. And I believe uh, you had some more questions, yeah? We have a question on the internal. So all these reactive variables, yes. uh, how was this implemented? Is it a it's based on observables.gl. The, the macros uh, under the hood, what they do is they generate the calls to uh, declare the observables.gl package, uh, sorry, functions. I completely agree on that. So yeah, general, yeah, let's say uh, websites, static websites. Actually in the documentation, it might be a little hidden, but we have some tutorials for building uh, static websites that just uh, do load them once and they stay there with the information. But yeah, definitely we would like to uh, have more examples than more just uh, reactive user interfaces and dashboards. The thing is that, I mean, nowadays, since we are focusing on data, or data seems to be more demanded, so it's uh, easier to also, well, to get cool things done, you know, with uh, interactive dashboards and stuff, but yes, definitely, uh, we will, uh, with time, we will develop those kinds of sites. Yes? In your Yes. Sorry, yeah, the, you are talking about, let me just pull it up. Yeah, this thing right here, right? Yeah. So your question is? Like what do you use to build this? Yeah, this is, uh, for <laughs> to build the slides, I used Vue.js. I used a framework called SlideDev, where you can just define your uh, view components, and you can use them in the slides themselves. I think it should be doable. It's a little more complicated than that because the thing about uh, the view component, like this is a view component, right? Like, let me just uh, show you what it looks like. So you see, this is uh, actually my slides, which are in the markdown. But if we go to the components, 
I have the bowel counter here. And this is pretty similar to what we had in the, in the Julia code, where we have the UI. And then down here, we have the logic with a function that counts the vowels, right? And we have the variables. So what we do in, like, this is similar to what Gini does, in that in our Gini app, we just have the UI, and all of this, the script here, will be defined in the Julia part, right? So. Yeah, I call it this here in JavaScript in order to include it. Like, it might be possible to uh, include a Gini app in a view site, but the complexity will lie in linking the, let's say, the component in the view. Like, uh, well, let me try to explain. Essentially, do we need to tell the component that this part here, the script, is located in the Julia backend? So we need to establish the two-way co uh, coordination between this and that. So it's something that actually I, I would like to, to do at some point, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting prospect. But yeah, it should be doable. It's not a straightforward, definitely. Uh, yeah, sorry. In the machine learning yeah. page, you show the model being applied to apps. Yes. So the user gets their own model thing. Yes. I guess that's where the database connection is on. Is that a good example? Yeah. Um, if you had a database connection, I don't. I don't, actually, I don't know. I don't think so. You would have a, like you, you connect once to the database, and then you would just submit queries to the database. And in that case, uh, this has nothing to do with reactivity or anything. It's just uh, like what you would have is, let's say, let me look at the code for this uh, simple application, right? Let's say that you, here, every time you type in a message, you want to make a call to a database to extract some something related to that message, just right? Then what you would have is here on the top, define a function to extract this data from the database. This will be a function in the global scope, and then you would call it from here, just like we do here with the count vowels. I, not, right now, I don't see why we would have the database connection be a reactive variable, because in, in this case, there is no risk of uh, conflict between users, or I don't see it. Yeah, well, in that case, yeah, well, for that, you would have to use sessions, probably, and sessions, yeah, you, there, we have support for sessions, and cookies as well, so you could use that. Yes, uh, you could, yes, you could have, um, multiple pages sharing information, you would, I mean, it would be, uh, I have not tried that yet, <laughs> so sorry, but uh, I mean, this is the kind of questions that gets me thinking, okay, so how would we go about that? But yeah, definitely, uh, you could have a, a reactive block per page. You would have to define, let's say, a dictionary, a global dictionary for sharing information between them, and this is how you would pass information. I, I mean, at first glance, this is how I would do it. I don't know if there's better ways. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so kind of uh, no JS, but reverse no J no JS. No, I don't think that's even. How would you anyone do that? I don't think so. Like, yeah, it would be great to uh, write the front end just in pure Julia and have it run in the browser, but I think that's uh, too tall of a, of a task for uh, our group of four people. So if uh, anyone in the community can, wants to <laughs> join that effort, yeah, definitely. That would be great. But, <laughs> but no. Any, any more questions? OK. Um, are we, OK, so oh, yeah, there's more questions out there, sorry. Yeah, so you have a plot recipe. I'm not sure that there's, a, because that uses the plot package, right? 
Um, so yeah, your, my view is that you would have to define a custom function that generates the trace and the layout for that object and yeah, and just returns these two variables, the layout and the trace, and you just plug them into the reactive code. And this is definitely a good question because this is something that we have thought about, like defining, uh, at least for package makers, having predefined visualizations for their objects, let's say for the Flux people, how to display a neural network in a Gini app. You could have a recipe where you just plug in your network, whichever structure it has, and it will automatically be plotted without having to define anything. So yeah, uh, we are thinking about something like recipes, but it's, uh, in, it's also not a quite easy problem to solve yet. Yes? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that could be, um, yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely a good idea. Let me, uh, yeah, because the, uh, the plot has many backends, like it has uh, LaTeX, um, yeah, Plotly as well. So, yeah, so we could, could do a Plotly Jenny. Good idea. Okay. Also, so allow me to ask, because I heard someone before, the, like someone on Discord told me that they were coming. Is there anyone else here from the Discord community or? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> two guys. Okay, <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> yes. Um, can Can you repeat again? Yeah, Unisex. Well, I can say that uh, Unisex Six is uh, going to have a very big focus on improving performance. Uh, Adrian is currently working on it, and there's been uh, quite significant improvements, especially when it comes to multi-threaded performance. So yeah, the number of requests that can be handled per time, uh, unit time has been increased, and I think it's also uh, optimized the uh, resource use usage. So yeah, it's mostly performance, and I will share that uh, some benchmarks uh, on the presentation. And yeah, we will open um, a testing period for Genesis where we will gather feedback from uh, the community and incorporate that. So yeah, stay tuned to the to the talk. Yeah. So we will stay here for uh, yeah until the session ends, sort of twenty more minutes. So if uh, anyone wants to come by and talk about something or ask any questions. You are welcome. Again, thanks for being here. Uh, see you around.